chair for the committee on design and Columbus AIA responsible for organizing the 2021 Columbus AIA Design Awards Jury. Uh, with great appreciation to the Milton School that's co sponsoring this lecture this evening and the American Institute of Architects Columbus chapter. Both Jose and I are from Caracas, so I'm delighted to introduce Jose Alvarez this evening. Jose is a jury chair for the 2021 Columbus AIA Design Awards jury and will also be presenting comments on the 2021 award winning projects at the reception tomorrow evening. A native of Caracas, Venezuela, Jose, Jose is the principal at SU Luna Temple, a talented designer and project architect with a design responsibility for many of the studio's largest projects. His creative work has led to dozens of design awards for projects such as the Louisiana State Museum and the New Orleans Bio Innovation Center and the Paul and Lulu Lanier University Art Museum and has contributed for the last 20 years to the successful growth of the firm. As the lead designer, Jose recently completed 1200 seat theater and performing arts venue in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and was an integral member of the design team responsible for the 930 Poitras residential tower. A mix to use high, contemporary high rise in the central business district of New Orleans and recipient of a national AIA housing board. In addition to his architectural design expertise, Jose leads the SU Humans Ripple MLK Day of Service program winner of the 2019 AIA Emerging Professional Exhibit and advocates for diversity and inclusion within the design profession. Jose has served as AIA State Delegate and is president of the National Organization of Minority Architects, Louisiana chapter, as well as a program coordinator for the AIA New Orleans Young Architect Forum, winner of the 2016 AIA Emerging Professionals Exhibit and the AIA Louisiana Emerging Professionals Award. Jose was the recipient of the 2015 AIA Young Architect Award for showing exceptional leadership and making significant contributions to the profession and was recently featured in the AIA Center for Civic Leadership publication, Living Your Life as a Leader. Jose is currently serving as commissioner for the City of New Orleans Board of Zoning Adjustments and the advisory board for the Tulane School of Architecture and Colocate Design Studio, a multidisciplinary nonprofit design justice practice focus on the design of spaces of racial, social, and cultural equity. Thank you so much, Jose, for making the trip up to Columbus for this lecture and the Design Awards reception tomorrow. We look forward to hearing about and seeing your projects and initiatives. Thank you, Amy. Uh, thank you, everybody, for showing up. Um, I'm excited to be here, and thank you to everybody that, that uh, kind of coordinated this event uh, for you guys in person. I understand this is the very first time you're back the space for a lecture, so I'm the guinea pig, and uh, I didn't know that, but that's good. Uh, and I think we're being also uh, um, recorded live uh, for audience, and um, so again, thank you very much for having me here. Um, one of the things that I really wanted to talk to you about today is um, one of the things that passions me the most about doing architecture, um, outside, obviously, uh, coming um, uh, being a design firm that is um, design first focus. Uh, our idea of design, uh, which is paired to sustainability, performance, it's only complemented by how we, how we collaborate and work with our community. So the, the lecture today is, is, is formed around uh, something that we have worked for a couple years, almost 10 years now, um, internally in our practice, which I think is something that um, can be commemorated as an advancement of how we really work with our communities and how we um, become you know, more than the sitting architect chapter that AIA wanted us to build a couple of years ago. So the lecture today is called Architecture Equals Everyone. Let's see if this works. I'm right here. There you go. So, in order, in order to get where we want to get today, um, we, we have to start at the very beginning of when this was actually brought up to us as a profession. And since this is the first time I have live audience, uh, anybody knows what the 1% uh, pro bono program from the AIA is? Yeah, it's pretty old. Um, it uh, actually was back in 2003, I think, uh, um, with John Peterson, an architect, 
was really focusing on kind of the idea of us that generated a program for public architecture, right? So it's a very pragmatic piece in the beginning of how we think about, about being that citizen architect. And, um, and it basically is nothing more than what you typically probably do already as practitioners, right? Or students or professors, right? You, you volunteer to make uh, your communities better, right? You sit on boards, you um, work with the AIA or with your school board, right? So those kind of connections with the city is what makes it a little more reachable as professionals and humans all together. But, you know, um, the important things to think about of what this program was about, it it was trying to is institutionalize, right? So, so find a way that we carefully think about creating a product for public architecture, but through leverage and design, right? And and in the purpose of strengthening our communities. And to me, that um, was taken very very deeply by our founding member Alan Eskew, who passed away a couple of years ago, right before we got the a firm award, sadly. Um, but the whole purpose of the program was to take 1% of your billable work as a professional, right? And use that time to better the community, right? At that time, this is 2003, it was said that it would, if we all do this, the owner of the practices, take that time, that's about 5 million hours a year that it gets dedicated, or basically 2,500 full-time employees working for the purpose of community work. Um, and if you kind of like do the math, that's about basically a 50-person firm working yearly in pro bono work in every single capital of the United States, right? So I think the difference, if you think about it, is that an individual um, can do very little, but when you combine everything, then it becomes massive, right? And so, um, that was 2003. In, in 2013, you know, we got, as the good AIA always challenges us, challenge, right? <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and, you know, I'm sure some of you are very familiar with the 2030 challenge and are part of that commitment, right? Um, and really a challenge, what it means is that you, 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 you understand where you are, you set a goal in the future, and you work yourself through that series of events that gets you to that destination, right? So for the one percent, the one plus was exactly that. It was challenging architects. And where the one percent would encourage you to do this, the difference is the one plus would challenge you. So basically, again, was brought up to us as professionals to say, how can you do this? How can you do it better? How can you create capacity? and how as firm practitioners, owners, uh, young professionals, educators, how we can collaborate in a way where we can do strides into um, and betterment our communities. And the mystifying really kind of what we are, right? Because we know we don't have a really good reputation out there of what we do, or what we do, nobody knows what we do, most, most, most people don't. Um, so that was kind of the challenge, and this started basically then. In 2015, a couple years after this One Plus Challenge came, and I like ask you, ask me, you know, how, how we can respond to this, right? Just like what we did and committed to the 2030 Challenge and I'm tracking, and we're reporting doing that right now. And you know, we have only a couple of years left to make uh, buildings 100% carbon neutral, right? I mean, it's a, it's a nice wish, and we're trying to get there, right? We're not perfect; it's difficult to get there. So for us, was that like? How do we create a program that allows the pro bono work to be a little more focused, a little more productive, allow to bring value to other things outside of that? And we call that our SQL uh, material theory service. So um, historically, uh, the firm has always kind of, this is the firm core values. As per Alan Eskew back in the firm conception, which about more than 35 years ago, and these are basically pillars Right, of waking up every day, this is what we want to do every day, right? And so, you know, design excellence, you're all great designers, talented work, we review it all on, on, on the awards, amazing stuff is coming out of, you know, you guys here. 
And, and so, so talent is not a problem, right? Client commitment, we know, we love our clients, we treat them as friends, we are the trusted advisor. So nothing new there, right? And building performance, back then was a little bit kind of what's going on, right? But yeah, the, the history of the practice has been always about sort of designing smart, designing passively, uh, looking at our buildings in a way that are different and embedding it in, in how they kind of correlate with the environment and the people that live in them. Um, I happily have to say that we, um, C. Smith, our director of sustainability, a couple years ago, went back and we measured buildings that we designed back uh, in, in 30 years ago, and they are performing even better than the benchmarks set by the 2030 challenge. Some of them are. So it's just like, you know, intuition, right? It's good practice. And I thought, I know all of you do that. Um, most recently, kind of demonstrifying, you know, that is a, a project that we just completed. There, there was the 2021 AIA um, Institute Honor Award, right? Original architecture. It's a data school uh, in Arkansas. This, this project came to us uh, through the Bolton Family Foundation Design Excellence Program. And um, we were able to develop the master plan um, and collaborate with actually Marlon Blackwell as well. Some of his building, rather that green building in the front is his. Uh, our building is the home house, which is behind. But again, you know, we're always practicing architecture that is beautiful, right? Great design. We are working with our clients. We do that every day. And if you're color cut of those, right, we're integral to that process, right? We work with our communities, we work with our stakeholders. We, in this case, this is the Thaddeus state, uh, Stakeholder Group, where, you know, we were talking to staff, professors, and everybody in the community that allowed this project to actually be what it was. And as we were designing, as they were designing the pedagogy, we were designing buildings that respond to this pedagogy. So it was really an integral, right? So client engagement is quite crucial. And then, you know, Sustainability, right? This is a performance landscape. The, the, the landscapes are designed to capture water. So it's embedded in a climate that is responsive to the building and to the people inside. But always community engagement is kind of, what is it, right? It's a community participation. It's a community outreach. It's uh, working with a community with a project, right? I mean, there's many definitions to that in my, in my point of view. And again, I know another wonderful um, sketch from Alan. Uh, this is the way he saw us as people, right? That the project is the core, but there's all these things that are affecting the project, right? And that we, this three-letter stool, and if you are not paying attention to these three things every day, you're missing it, right? You're falling off. And so uh, focusing on culture, on our profession like we're doing today, right, in the design awards, culturally, whether you are part of a board of a, you know, a facility or some sort, and civically, right? What are we doing as civic people? How are we doing for, for, the, for the better of the, of the good of others? And this is actually, a, I pulled this old slide, uh, and uh, you see Brian Lee from there. We were just talking about Brian Lee, the graph from here. Um, and Alan Esky is still there, but I pulled it because Alan was there, because he also had the, he had the energy. He was that sitting architect, we, before we all heard of that word. He was a person that, was out there really engaging in the community. And he transferred that kind of passion to the practice, right? He would allow, he would set up the parameters, he would encourage everybody in the studio, not only the principals, to be engaged. He wanted it that an EDR employee was always represented in every single event in the city. It was crazy. And we were like marching his orders, I'm saying. That. We were really following that lead, right? And, and that was just wonderful because it creates and encourages the ability for people to really be of service at any capacity, even the very beginning of your career. And so we have done that in the past, right? We, we, we were part of the uh, Make It Right Foundation, Pro Bono work, uh, following uh, great designers from Latin America that talk about really about the issues of expanding in local um, uh, countries and doing our own work in New Orleans with the development of projects like uh, Prospect One Welcome Center, which was built and put together by us uh, inside this warehouse, which is beautiful. The Prospect, for those who know, is really an arts and cultural program. I think they're in several cities. Um, Make It Right, we were one of the invited architects uh, to uh, design pro bono the, the, uh, the, the Make It Right Foundation um, housing. 
And uh, I'm glad to say that our, our design was the, the, the People's Choice Award. Um, and in the old invites that they were uh, from people from all over the world basically invited to New Orleans. So we were a local firm that we were really excited because it's actually quite a biblical home. And now that the foundation really didn't kind of hit all the marks, I think the ability to be able to service the community was an important part and take away out of this effort. And you know, the things that we all do, having that for humanity, this happens, you know, every day. So, the question to us is how do you build a, a, a practice around community about, about and, and we, you know, we, we, we developed this monograph about our work and it focuses just on that, right? How we can have wonderful architecture that is responsive to place and community in a civil way. So that was the past, right? And, and, and one of the things that I took from Alan was that, you know, we always need to think about the future and how to improve ourselves. Because if you're not changing, you're not evolving. And um, so this was kind of like our, our goal, right? The, 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 the day of service be, um, be, be founded by our skill sets um, in order for us to together increase the impact of the things that we're doing. So when we're talking about that comparison of the five million hours, right? If you, if you think about it, that is really for um, billable work, somebody working 40 hours a week, 160 hours a month, a 1% of that is one hour and a half, right? So it's nothing, I mean, not, so we, but, but think about it then, 50 people, right? Translates to about basically 50 hours, right? And so, 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 so the, the impact of putting people together purposely focusing on something, I think it's kind of where we were looking at. And particularly using skill base, because one of the things that, you know, my brother can do very well is, is hang sheetrock, right? But he cannot put a plan together. He cannot put a program together. He cannot look at facing diagram. He cannot work with a nonprofit to tell them, this is where you need to be, right? And so, so it's really skill based. And, um, as you look at the program, when we were forming this program, we were really looking at two things, like kind of what are the internal benefits of the practice? Because, you know, it's almost like you buy Tom's. Is it, is it Tom's the brand that you use? Like you buy one and then one gets skipped, right? It's like, it's nice to, to do good and feel good about it, right? And, and that's the premise of kind of like the human nature, I guess it is. But, you know, internally, I think uh, developing a program that develops, kind of leverages the culture of the studio was really important that you know we have an opportunity to mentor directly individuals of the firm have cross collaboration i mean i don't know how your studios are but we are right now in a series of basically three market sectors and we're focusing they're not studios but we are kind of gathering skill sets to create consensus um and and so most people don't work outside that team structure so you know, the ability to be able to know a colleague that sits three desks over there, but you're not working together is quite, quite impactful uh, to create commodity, you know, in the practice. Um, again, to imagine an ability to design a program that improves leadership. Um, and externally, again, the idea of reaching out about public architecture, you know, part of the community engagement, really about public education. But to me, the challenge will be then the plus, right? It's externally particularly, those three go together, advocacy, public awareness, and public appreciation, right? It is like the job of the AI for the longest time to try to get us to be out there in the community for people to understand what we do, right? For people to understand that, that, that the power of design and that design is accessible to all. So that is a very big thing here, right? to be able to people understand the value of design and they can reach it. And then internally, this extra effort um, can just bring you other sets of strategies, opportunities, relationships. And I wanna to touch a little bit about that last one right there, the research fellowship. So right when we started the Day of Service program, 2015, the year before we started the EDR fellowship, which is mainly, um, you know, we, we find subjects and things that we like to do as architects, things that we don't have time to research because we're so busy, you know, doing our work, that um, 
that allows us to hire a full-time employee for one year in a fellowship program, full-time dedicated to this particular subject, right? And for the last eight years or so, we have gone from resiliency to building materials, health environments. We have gone for um, um, envelope and net zero. We have gone for carbon counting, right? And um, our second year, uh, we, we, we actually had a fellowship that focused on, on community engagement. At that time, uh, the, her ask was to really kind of figure out a way the tools that we can use to better communicate with our communities at a project base, right? As architects, how do we, how do we invest in the community? How do we involve with them? How do we create, how do we actually run a community engagement session, right? How do we hear, what are the tools? So we created a whole set of toolkits and everything that I'm talking about is available for download if you need, if you want to see it. It's all there, right? It's all a database that is that is for, okay, our gesture to the architecture practice. And, but one of the, the focus was that then we can use the day of service to even further uh, exemplify or use case studies on the research part, right? So at the beginning, it was that idea that the research was tied together to the day of service as a way for example, if we we're going to do about talk about resiliency, right? That the praise that we were actually looking for in support of our community had a resilient subject or subject matter, in fact. Right? So this is Nicole Justin. Awesome. Um, she helped us. Then when when we were figuring all this out, and then we say, okay, well, we need her help. So she helped us actually prepare ourselves and put together the program. Right, so kudos to her because we didn't know what we were doing and she helped us. Um, and so as a good kind of community engaged type of person, she run services in the studio and asked people like, what type of projects do we want to do? Like, what are the skills that you want to try to work on while you are doing these community services? Um, and what are the community issues that you want to work? Okay, because I think the key of, of, of the day of service to us is that not only we're helping community, but we're also helping the studio grow in, in subjects, right? Whether it's leadership, whether it's projects that we will never take on because just simply our overhead will, you know, doesn't afford those things. Or our projects that, you know, somebody that is a, um, a board member of a community can bring in and then bring more resources to that project. So it's a, it's a balance of what we would like to do. And imagine if you're doing pro bono, but project that you love, it's not just painting walls for having other humanity. It's a, it's a game changer, right? And so she helped us kind of create an implementation plan and all these pieces and components are resolved, right? Um, from you know planning the program and requesting for proposals and project selection. So we'll go a little bit through that. Um, one, of, one of the biggest part of the program is planning, right? And uh, we start right now. We start at the end of September, the beginning of October. We select, uh, now that we have this pair, the, the researcher uh, fellow from the actual day of service, uh, we, we, we are able to then um, kind of bring that knowledge back to the studio because what we were getting is that even though that two of our research fellows we hire permanently, they mostly move on to better things. And so that knowledge of working and doing the day of service kind of got lost with me. Right? So we said, well, we, we want to keep that in the studio. We want to just build on that. And so um, uh, we have a committee that is represented uh, now by our administration staff, by business development staff, by the design staff, and by myself as the principal. Right? So we cross basically every kind of skill set in the studio represented in that committee. And the reason is because we want to make sure that the projects that we do are, are benefit not benefit. Every project that we select have the ability to 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 uh, we use every skill set that we can provide in the studio, right? So typically, you know, your administration staff, like you know, it's difficult to pair in a design project. So what are the projects that we find that we can actually make those connections? And we start in September early. We just actually uh, announce our our new coordinator. It's going to be announced on Monday, actually, in the studio. But it's called Will Matter. <laughs> And Will will be heading the coordinating board. 
on the program. So his job is really to rattle the cages, make sure everything's ongoing, making sure he's gonna put an RFP together that is being sent out um, to all the organizations. So we, every year we build a roster of more organizations and more organizations. So now I think our, our, our community list is about 120 organizations that we send this RFP to, all in the local New Orleans and regional area. Um, and as we do that, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very aggressive program. We have about two months to do RFPs, collect the RFPs, review them, narrow them, then do an internal pinup uh, to present the projects, and then get a selection process, then inform our partners that the project, they're being selected, and then actually engage with them in workshops to the day of service, which uh, we have selected, obviously, uh, the best day possible that we can uh, give um, back to the community, which is Martin Luther King Day. So that is the actual day of service. We take that day completely, and I'll talk more a little about it. But the RFP basically, this is focused on the regional, uh, nonprofit organizations. Um, we look for organizations that have the capacity to be part of the day of service as it relates to, we want them in the table, working with us through the work that we're doing. This is not like, you know, tell me what you need, I'm gonna give it to you, and goodbye. This is really an engagement process because we wanna build that connection really to these organizations. And what has proven out is that most of the younger staff get involved to the point that they wanna then volunteer to that organization and they're doing drawings for that organization. And they are like uh, helping rallies with that, right? So it's really kind of, that that creates that network that we really wanted it to happen. And so uh, the RFP basically summarizes the projects, and we give a month or so to this to, to return. Um, uh, the coordinator role there is really to kind of make sure the answers any questions, assist fill in the forms and the information that we have in, right? Because some organizations don't even have the capacity to fill the forms. So we're kind of helping them in that regard. And then when we get all of them, and I'm gonna say probably, and most likely the most three years, we have been getting about 30, 35 responses to the RFP. Um, we go then, the committee reviews them and look at them at, in the lens through, uh, you know, what I talk about the organization. Um, is, it, is, is the project that they're asking really in benefit of the organization? Is the project balance, uh, is, is it doable within the time frame that we want to give it to it? Uh, is the deliverables actually achievable? Um, is it enough differences in the project so everybody can have a take home? So we take that selection down and we present the proposals back to the studio for review. And at this time, we go from probably 30 or 40, we go to 15 selections. So it's, it becomes quite narrow. And then we present, the committee present those to our, our studio. And the studio then votes. And, um, and it's basically almost like, you know, a charrette that you would have in any, in any community engagement. It's like, which design you like the best, which project you like the best, and then everybody gets dots, and it's like you put your name on your dot and you put like, Jello is your option one and red is option two, right? So we get, it. So, so we narrow the projects then further back for the things that the, the, the visuals of the studio really wanna work on, right? So it takes away kind of like the preconceptions of what I think is better for them or the committee, it's really kind of a, a free choice. And, and, and that's the way you really kind of then they focus and people get excited then to show up and do it, right? It's like, it's create that energy, which is all about. And so we thank them. And so what happens is that then naturally we get about five, five projects. It narrows us down pretty, pretty typically. Uh, and so, you know, we have some spotted dots and then we try to convince those that, you know, come, come to another team. So, Cause we're about 50 people and we have found all the, now all these years that actual, the actual right number for us is about 10 people per team, right? So 10 people focus on one project and we're 50 and works out pretty, quite well. And so the teams then, you know, we, we ask for the teams and the teams are put together basically on your first or second choice. So, you know, you're either gonna work in the project that you like or the next project that you like. And then we ask them to, hey, why don't you, uh, who wants to volunteer to be basically a captain, a team captain, right? Um, and, and typically sometimes it's easy, sometimes people just don't wanna do it, you know, because it does take a lot of responsibility. And so when, when we do that, then the, 
the captains then really take charge. The coordinator becomes a second, a, in second place. We can make sure just like a credit manager things are going on, but your credit captain is your, your credit architect, right? He is day to day with the client, day to day with the team, figuring out the things, figuring out the meetings, like uh, what is the deliverables? What is the timeline? How many times we're gonna meet? Do we need to go see a site? Do we need to do interviews to, to the user group? So that's the responsibility of the co-captains. And we always think two is good because one can feed from each other. And then, you know, obviously all this is happening with project responsibilities, right? Let's make, let's make sure that, you know, work is happening while all this is happening. So we're taking um, that, that piece of the puzzle. And of course, you know, it's understandable, you know, we, we treat our, our, our employees as adults. And we know that if there's a deadline there, that's the priority, right, for projects. But this is actually something that is flexible and we allow that to happen within studio hours if it's needed in order to get things advanced for, for, the, for the day. So we coach our co captains and it's, a, it's a basically a mentorship structure. We pair them with uh, uh, experienced project manager to ensure that, you know, when they're committing and talking with the clients about deliverables, they actually have the, the, you know, the nerve to say no because we're talking about you know two to three year uh, emerging professionals, right? I mean, this is most likely young young adults starting their career and putting in positions of leadership, which is part of the whole game, right? For them to be able to feel responsible, for them to be able to engage with clients directly, and kind of flip this whole idea of the pyramidal sort of experience bucket, which is great because like. You know, I have a, a, a two, three year captain telling me go do code research for this project, which is awesome, right? right. Um, so it becomes an empowering tool. It becomes actually a point of leadership. But then we have like, you know, our project managers there making sure that things are running and they have a safety net. And we give them this pragmatic list of all the things that you should do, just checklist all these things. So it's really put together at this time now, you know, it wasn't this, this coordinator a couple of years ago, uh, but I think now we, we got it down. Always obviously uh, areas of improvement. So Martin Luther King Day of Service, well, it's all Martin Luther King, we do it on the studio, and as I told you before, this is a kind of like all hands on deck. Everybody in the studio is working on this, everybody's collaborating. By this day, you know what you're doing the day you walk on the door at eight in the morning, right? And you know what you're gonna do and what are the deliverables and what are you gonna, at the end of the day, what you should hand in. So everybody has a task, a sole plan, to the purpose of meeting our clients demand or ask, right? So the day of service is, is, is a huddle. Uh, it happens in the conference room. Some, some, some have happened off, off the office in their organization's uh, headquarters or, or if it was a, um, an outside project, it was outside. Um, but it's wonderful because it's really kind of, everybody's there, we, we as I said, we, we ask of our, of our partners to come in and be with us during that day, right? And being part of that experience, being part of the feedback, so it's a continuous, so it's almost like, um, um, you know, a P3 collaboration, right? It's like everybody on the team for that. So, after the day of service, um, we take a week to break, we put all the presentation, everything that we do produce together in a formatted package that are deliverable, just like you would give to a client. And then, um, and I'm sure you, most of you have like a Friday session, Friday forum, Thursday pinups, I don't know, like something internally in your office where you take a break from work and you have a couple beers and you hang out with your coworkers and, don't, and talk about all the things that is not work. Right, so we have a satellite thing on Fridays at four o'clock. Close the shop. We have sometimes invited guests. Uh, I mean, I, not necessarily they're related to design. Sometimes are architects, sometimes designers, sometimes are just leaders of nonprofits. Um, my preference when we invite chefs and they talk about food. Right, we had a baker that brought bread. It's awesome. Um, so we use this venue to do kind of these outreach things for the office and and to invite guests. But also we use this to, um, as the venue in which we then present the work back. And the wonderful thing about this is that, again, these are five organizations that not, at that time have not really worked or met together. So this day is a presentation of both the 
our partners and the design team, right? So they get to talk about who they are, what are their interests, what are they working, what is going on, and then the, the design team talks about this is the challenge, this is what we produce, and then at the end of the, you know, it's a kumbaja of love and everybody high fives and this is awesome. And you know, and then the organizations then get to meet each other, which is actually nice because we have found that some of them actually are, have synergies and then they can help each other and connect. Again, it's, it's all about growth, that network. And it's, it, it is just like that. So we have like a couple monitors going on at the same time. We've got all the presentations spin up on the walls and it is really, so of course last year was different, right? Last year, we all had this problem right we couldn't see each other and so uh we we so uh as, as you heard i mean uh, I, I was for many years uh the president of noma louisiana and um um and and we i want to say probably single-handed designed the curriculum that today's use as called pre pipeline actually brian lee and i worked that together the, the, the grassroots of that thing and and, and which it was already a, a program by the National Organization of Minority Architects, we really just thought of all, like, it's, it, it, you know, it was, at that time it was just a camp and, you know, little sticks and stuff. And we really turned it into a community asset to really bring design ideas to the public and to bring to young folks how to think about design and how their voice is important in the community, right? That understand that they have a voice in how to shape their neighborhoods. And so from that, um, you know, we were able to then um, bring those ideas and um, of, of teaching through. Um, we, we had a couple classes uh, through internet, so we used that idea in mirror boards, which became a wonderful tool. And last year we did it all remotely. And I have to say that it was like nothing had happened. It was amazing that the partners were engaged, like the work happened in the mirror board like you would have imagined it happening in a conference room. And I was actually surprised and nervous at the same time, but it actually was a success. And so this year, you know, we don't know what's gonna happen. Like, you know, we might actually be able to do it, uh, or who knows, we might be able to do a parallel where it's live and, and virtual, which then allows us then to even reach further, which I think one of the limitations of the program is that, you know, we are who, where we are, you know? And I think this is kind of like an interesting thing to think about how this can become something more national. Um, going back to the challenge, the problem with the challenge is that you have to self-reflect, right? Like 1020 challenge, milestones, you gotta check the box, you gotta make sure you're tracking it, right? Same thing, so we put ourselves through that same kind of set of conditions through the program. So we self-evaluate and report on the program, right? To make sure that we're making progress. And we do, so, do that by interviewing our partners, interviewing our staff, um, and one of the interesting things that comes out of, out of this, and Ria made me realize how bad we're doing in communicating the value of architecture and design to others that are not architects and designers, is that most people that had worked for us for the first time, they had never met an architect. They had never known an architect could do what, they, what we did for them, right? So it just creates awareness. If anything, it creates awareness, right? And that's what we want as professionals. Um, some of the, um, uh, yeah, well, so this one right here, see, did you see the value in design? Yes, 100% we understand that it's a valuable asset that before as an, as an organization, I never had the chance to. And again, these are our partners doing this. Um, and again, questions about like, would you ever then reach out again to an architect to be able to service you in a matter outside a pro bono service, like now that you know, and they say it's most likely yes. Well, that is, to me, a win, right? Because before they were not even thinking about this. So, and then we report, basically drive everything down, we create these wonderful books, we do a plus delta internally to make sure that our coordinator tell us how we did, our, our captains, we sit, we sit around coffee and we talk about how we can improve the program. So every year we do this and we, do some new thing every year that makes it a little bit better, right? Um, and so in our fifth year anniversary, we had then worked with 35 communities, uh, partners. And, and so we said, well, what is, what a great idea to bring those 35 partners together, right? And do a day of service about kind of like the follow-up, like what happened with these organizations after we did all these things? 
had they increased capacity? Had they been able to, to complete the projects that they were asked to do? What is the status? So we did an exhibit in, the, I, in this space in New Orleans um, where we exhibit all that work and then had panel discussions about quality, we had panel discussions about neighborhood associations, about homeless, and all about everything, every organization that we have part of with was volunteering to give talks about kind of the issues that they're facing, and it became a really interesting sort of, you know, colloquium of work. And that's where our Consent for Everyone logo came out, out of that exhibit. And, um, and, and hopefully what we're probably gonna try to do is create a monograph of the work of all these organizations, right? Because it's really their work, it's not our work. We were just the delivery method. And we're making t-shirts, you know, we're making the whole brand and thing went on that. But like the, 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 and I pulled out a couple of ones that I was involved in because, you know, I would say I can probably not talk smart about the other, you know, uh, 20 submissions that we did, but like I were, I personally felt that I had connection with like the 10 that I have participated in the last something, eight years or so. And so, libel wilderness. It was a, it's a, it's a, it was a, at that time it was an initiative to create a kind of summer leadership camp for kids that uh, basically didn't couldn't afford camp, right? So it was a free camp for leadership, and it was actually the schools would have promote those students that showed tremendous leadership that were at risk and they didn't have the capacity to pay for camp into this organ non profit organization that then they will like host this summer camps on leadership and activities and so on. And, and the first year, which was a year before we did this, they actually had, um, um, had rent a space in this wilderness camp. And so their goal really was to create a formal camp, right? Right now they were just renting a, a space and they were then um, uh, you know, inviting the kids and they had day camps in the midland. So they wanted a permanent camp. And so, we went to the site, we took these sketches, we sketched over them, and their, their, their ask was, we wanna, we wanna be able to produce material content, um, fundraising material, to inspire others to see our vision, right? They couldn't do it, they asked us to do it. So that's what we did, we created kind of a, a projection plan, a, a economy path plan, so our, our CFO was like crunching the numbers, see how make that happen, like a projected escalation rates and things like that. So everybody was working. Uh, our graphic designers were working on this, and so our architects, of course, and then, well, they took this package, and then they went to schools, and to parents, and to um, other stakeholders, and they were able to raise enough money to then buy the land that they were renting before, right? And this is one of our repeated clients, as I call it, right? Uh, you treat your clients well, they treat you nice, right? But they came back then two years later and say, hey, now we have the land, now we really want to think about how we expand campus and how do we kind of build in aggregation, right? So we, we the, the following board was really about kind of how did you design, you know, you start with the kind of the tippy and the very basic kind of protective like tent-like uh, approach and then how you move to a more permanent structures. So this was great. Santosha also a great experience. This was actually um, focused on providing transitional housing for um, homeless veterans in New Orleans. So the whole purpose was to kind of create a villa of uh, tiny homes uh, to house temporarily veterans until they went to the transition. You know, um, they were support uh, psychologically, that they were trying to create a campus, a safe campus. Um, and so they, they were, um, they had don somebody donated them like a, like a trailer wheel thing, right? So, so we designed the house to go on top of that and it, as a, an exemplary way that they can build. And we had a part, kit of parts, so actually the veterans and, and, and the community can just build these houses, right? Um, to be able to house them. So it was almost like a self, like motivation thing. It seemed that, you know, a lot of the things coming out of um, the veterans is, is uh, they feel, really not use, uh, they cannot provide any, any use. And so given the task, like building their own house was actually actively working in the benefit of, 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 of their own sort of psychological betterment. And, um, and this last one that I wanna share here is Uncommon Construction, which is a great part of the bus as well. But they have like, again, a nonprofit um, um, uh, that focus on training high school students in the trace of uh, uh, construction workforce, right? 
at their high school levels and they're paid to do this as they get curriculum and then they get paid in credits so they can buy kind of their own toolkit, right? So you're basically kind of giving them kind of the knowledge and the, and the tools to be construction worker, right? And so like the beautiful thing is for, for this partnership, so they do a bunch of stuff, right? They, 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 they work in schools, they work in, in community, they do gardens, they do like outdoor theaters. And so what they ask us to do is create a template or pre-manufactured kit of parts so the students can follow basically a Kia catalog of how to do a dog part, right? And they will take that and do it and take it to the kids and the kids will build these things in yards and stuff. So really a great, wonderful organization that we love to talk to. So the last project that I wanted to talk to that is gonna link a little bit and kind of close us off for any questions that you might have, it's uh, the New Orleans Downtown Development District. You know, we all have it in our cities and they approach us with a, a, a ephemeral project, but a project that it was about trying to create um, um, an approach to a, a, a design of a, a box retail in downtown New Orleans, right? Um, in the typical site, right, which is about 300 by 200 square feet. And the reason is because New Orleans has a moratorium basically on all sort of big box retail in the city of New Orleans. So you go over to New Orleans, if you want to go to Target, you got to go to Metairie or the West Bank, you got to go outside. The, the metro area. And so, um, the, the, you know, which is bad for you know, downtown development district. They want to create jobs, they want to bring commerce, and they want to create, you know, a city that is vibrant where you can just shop right there. You don't have to go like get in your car. So it, it's, it, it brings economic benefit to them and to the city. And so they asked us to just generate these very basic plannings for them so they can use for marketing material and then they can use to really take it to, you know, the city and say, hey guys, we really need to work on this moratorium stuff. So that didn't happen, but um, um, the project itself, um, and you'll find in a minute why I'm bringing it up, this is, guys, not rocket science. I mean, you guys, I mean, seriously, uh, a first year architecture student can do this work, right? Uh, but one of the things that, that we, we, we loved about this project was kind of like imagine, okay, what is the perfect retail box? I mean, we don't do that as a practice, you know, what, how do you do that? We, we're not really sure. But what we need to sure is that we know the place. We know New Orleans. We know the type of characteristics and the things that would make something like this work in the downtown New Orleans. So, you know, if you, if you think about this project, you know, um, uh, they, they had you know, uh, asked us that this, this imaginary site had a primary street, like Canal Street or Porter Street, and secondary streets in a, in a, in a third back of Howell Street. And you know they wanted to basically to be all ground floor retail with the box, box on top, um, managing sort of high truck deliveries and managing parking on the building to try to bring cars as fast as possible out of the site uh, in order to um, reduce issues with with uh, with traffic. So the the big idea here, which is not a big idea, was to basically kind of extend back the building, create a larger sidewalk. So, you know, it was more pedestrian friendly, and that opportunity to have retail coming out, you know, cafes, things like that. Not another magic solution to bring kind of like the courtyard or the space and board, create a dog trout, a covered entrance where you can have people sort of sitting outside and then maybe light at the end of that space to kind of bring light down and maybe, you know, not very usually um, retailers have an experience of an outside, but maybe why not, right? Daylight is good. Um, it's good for us. So, you know, very basic kind of like strategies here. Uh, moving up the plan, you know, this is, this will be a podium type building, so that we were concerned about mechanical systems. So, you know, we created a well in the building to hold us because the fifth elevation is quite important in a city surrounded by, you know, tower buildings. Um, in a very sort of very mundane section of what this thing can look like, organizing parking in multiple levels, reducing that high, Graving the retail, you know, 20 foot high, which is what is more common. But this section was kind of fascinating. And then, you know, really kind of say, if you are going to build something like this in New Orleans, these are the, the three principles that you might have uh, if you're going to think about it. Well, one is to really kind of bring the ground floor in on all things, because you know, New Orleans rains a lot, right? We've got six inches of rain in the summer every day, from four to six p.m. every day. It rains, pours. And so you want to protect pedestrians. So, and the strategy that is about place, right? Obviously, you want to 
beautify the street with greenery. Um, the second strategy is that, you know, podiums buildings are always quirky, particularly if you have multiple uses. So maybe the idea of having, is having something that wraps around uniformly the facade at all facades, so there's not a front and a back because downtown, ultimately, it doesn't have back roads. It's pretty much a 360 degree approach. Uh, and all of these were really thought about, there's this podium and then residential in some sort of way as a tower, right? And I, I chose not to show those because of really no, no point of it. But this is the one I wanted to get to, kind of the courtyard experience. And you know, New Orleans would love to be outside, even though it's 98 degrees and it's 100% humidity, right? It's hot, it's humid, but it works, right? And so it's experiential, and this is what happens in New Orleans. So we think if you're gonna do something like this, which is nothing like New Orleans, if you're gonna put a big box in here, you have to bring the experiences to like New Orleans, right? So the idea of the dog trail, the courtyard space, the light on the back, uh, penetrating the light, whatever. So that was kind of the service project for them. And I wanna say probably two years later, um, a developer approaches us and asks, hey, I have this opportunity of buying all this, about you know, three blocks in downtown New Orleans to create this called South Market District, and we want you to be the planning, the master planner for it. So I said, well, absolutely, we'd love to do that. We, we did that exercise, and then, you know, consequently, we, we built for him um, two projects, right? Uh, he wanted to have click changes and different architect, which I think is always safe, it's always good. Um, and so we got two of those projects. But when we were brainstorming about this project, uh, I referenced this. I referenced, remember that thing that we did about kind of breaking the block and, and bringing retail inside? And, and, and seriously, this was the critique for the beacon, right? Which is a mid rise, very straightforward apartment building in the middle of downtown New Orleans that kind of reflects kind of all these basic concepts of a continuous sort of very you know unifying skin, not nothing very expensive, right? This is a 123 units full ground floor retail. Um, I think if I, if I yeah, so this is about 27. Uh, million dollars and about 170,000 square feet. So it's about 150 dollars per foot, uh, which is you know good good in the in developers' years. Um, but this idea that then the building has a gesture about about city, about place, about the community, about let yourself come inside and enjoy. So the project is located right at the center in in downtown New Orleans. Is five minute walks from from the Superdome and, and all of those great things right there by the river as well. And the the, the uh, so this building doesn't have parking incorporated because the developer actually asked us to design a parking garage called the Park um, that serves parking for all the development. Right. So there's one single parking structure and then all these little structures. So going back to the building, um, you know, this is this is something that is very risky for a developer. Um, as you might as well know, because it opens the building to the public, right? Which has always have been kind of like a challenge for us as architects to so really try to integrate architecture in the public realm with the private realm. But he was with us. He was he, in downtown New Orleans. There's very few green spaces and places for people in downtown. So, so our gesture was to okay, this is a place for the community. And you know, if you look up here, this is kind of your your usual, right? You have like the typical donut or the old kind of development multifamily with a green space in the middle of the pool and the amenities. Um, so we took the, the DDD approach where it's what if we open you know, the building and create that a public amenity, right? The people can walk in, can be part of the space. Um, another thing that we, we, we thought is important is that if you're gonna bring people like there, you really need to bring a lot more natural light than the one that by default gives you uh, proportions of opening like an old or a new shape. But then the magic was was this I think, um, where where one of the designers said, well, what if we just bring that up, right, and create some sort of natural amphitheater there that people can uh, use the dog trout 
idea of this cover entrance, and then all this can be activated for the street and support retail. And that's exactly that's what happened, right? This is the ground floor plan of the building. And, you know, three streets, um, service on the back, retail on both ends, uh, uh, almost, uh, you know, I want to say 90%, 80% utilization on the ground floor for retail, which is, you know, pays big bucks to the developer. So this was a great move. And then the idea of pushing all the lobby and all the entrance of the building to the back, where there's a center core that distributes you in, in the loop of up above. Having, you know, bike storage, because uh, the developer was really a fan of like downtown and biking. We, we do that a lot there. And in this idea of this entry plaza that then supports all this retail. And now this is all food and beverages uh, retail components. So every, everybody that wants to be outside, you see this pack of people and it's programmed with music and it's really just a wonderful experience. And as you move up, those steps, the core kind of turns it itself where the building then lowers and peels off to allow natural light to come in and then ends with the gesture of a roof terrace that it gets you high enough where you can actually see the downtown New Orleans. Now, originally in the design, that space was public, but the developer felt that, you know, that premium space had to be used by the tenant user, which, you know, yeah, it's understandable. So going back to the entrance, this is that pivotal point where you can continue going in, and that's the reception desk is presented, so visitors will come and check in there. Bike storage is underneath this level. This is the, the retail bar, and as you go up, right, this is a wonderful experience. I mean, I love this part because those who live in the first floor don't even need to go to the lobby. They can just go up the step, so it becomes a really active process of getting into the building, which is, you know, um, kind of, the idea and go back to the courtyard. If you've been in New Orleans, you don't walk to housing in the French Quarter through a door and go up the stairs. You walk into the courtyard. The courtyard is part of the experience of walking into somebody's home. And then from the courtyard, you move up, right? So similar here, you know, the building users, can you go up into the space, connect with the neighbors, the friends, somebody eating pizza from downstairs and kind of turn the corner and get into the building that way, right? So it becomes a really more, almost like, you know, it's healthy to walk steps, guys, so well, celebrate, right? And so here you see at the end, kind of this open gesture where we have open circulation, and on the other side, oh, well, this image. So this is great because it kind of demonstrates kind of like how that natural light kind of washes back of that wall, which is great because it then really kind of doesn't become this sort of closed space. It's, it's, it's very open, very airy, um, uh, circulation air is amazing. Otherwise, you know, it will be a problem with that. And um, and as you pass those bridges, right, this is kind of the public part of it. Uh, you have this wonderful terrace that you know can be experienced as you walk through the building. So you walk out of the building and back into the building as part of the circulation strategy. You look into the public courtyard, and then you're here in this sort of up of door that then looks back into downtown New Orleans, right, in the Mississippi River, which is a really wonderful place. And that's just really, you know, two stories, three stories up, right? So you're right there at the scale of the warehouse district, which is that podium hat that we were just discussing before. So, to end, designing a program that allows you or staff to create a great interior design culture, um, a program that allows you to work with the community. A program that um, it, it, it creates awareness of our profession and what we do. Um, and a program that also allows you to generate ideas that are fun and exciting that you might be able to use in a project or maybe not. It's what I call that challenge and what we call the EDR day of service or architecture world for everyone. So thank you very much and I'll take your questions if there's any. to at the beginning of the lecture state that people watching online can also post their questions online to Lisa. So we'll be uh, trying to moderate questions online and in person. But are there any questions here first? Yeah. Uh, 
Um, so, yeah, right. So, <laughs> uh, I'm curious, you know, because you've been doing the data service for quite six years, so it's probably more than 30 projects it sounds like. I'm curious if you've seen the, the return on investment that you've kind of spent on projects that have come out of some of the, the leading ones that you've done in the data service. You, you indicate with the one that you can't pay back and had a return to the maximizing side, but I'm curious if there's any sort of data unpacking that supports the investment side. No, there's no financial incentive. Um, uh, you know, you always have in the back of your mind that these nonprofits, you know, will get to the point where, um, you know, the price that you do for them kind of, you know, they'll come back to you and say, you know, we, we're now, we've got the fundraiser, let's, let's do this like headquarter deal, right? Um, but it has been to us, to me, it has been particularly the, the focus, it's really more about the pedagogy part of everything else, right? It's like the ability to, to entice employment. Um, I mean, I, I also run, or are you know one of the ones that kind of works um, uh, staffing and, uh, and hiring in the firm, right? And one of the things that I hear when somebody calls a, I want to work with EDR, is obviously the design, sustainability, all this stuff, and it's like, you know, the state of service, this work that you're doing is really inspiring, and I want to work there, right? And so. The, the, the quality of candidates that are encouraged by a firm that practices um, in this matter brings just talent that otherwise wouldn't. And you wouldn't want somebody that has that sensibility working with a firm that is really focused about kind of creating this, this elevating community um, as part of our do to, to what we do, right? And um, so I, I would say that uh, we I was still waiting for that one project that comes in that it is part of this, but really to me it's more more satisfying the fact that we have been able to, with the commitment, right, utilize those dollars for the community that otherwise we would have spent the same way doing other things, right, helping the community, but then this way, you know, and and, and I'm, I should have said that this is on top of Again, us serving boards and doing all this thing, this is just a plus, right? And so to me, it has been you know, just a way to, to, to organize it to us in a way that, that allows and staff to really be purposeful and kind of find, find, find joy you know, ultimately on it. Now, I do think money-wise, there's some dollars you can write off as it relates to research or things like that, but you know. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Let's see. Um, you gave a great explanation about the EDR's process for the day of service, lots of advice. Uh, they may seem overwhelming to firm leaders. So, what best advice? to get started um, because it, it, it's really holistic to see the process and your firm has been doing this for many years so yeah that's so, just nice to get started so so you know um our our previous executive director for the aia asked as asked us to try to find a way to take the program public like meaning like taking it outside the er as something that we do it's something that is really kind of engaged by aia community together and so we, um, we have been putting out a white paper together that kind of teaches the, outlines the basics, right? But one of the things that I, that I found that if you're starting, you, you really can use any scale, right? I mean, we're, we, we designed the scale because it's the size of a firm. So I don't, I don't think that that changes. If, if, you know, if you're a firm of three or a firm of one, Right, you can still do it. You can still take the time and do exactly what we're doing. Um, and and so um, it is overwhelming. But the nice thing is that you know you have colleagues that allows us to do it. Uh, we have been thinking um, as we think of how how to expand this. Is that um, um, my vision is that we can then have firm join the entire process. Right, take the EDR out of it. Right, and really be about architects' day of service, 
and allow them to, for example, small firms that don't have the, you know, the overhead to, man, I gotta work on my project, you know, I cannot think, you know, whatever it is, to allow them to then kind of maybe become a project manager for the process, right? And then invite smaller firms to be part of the process and do all the work still, but then invite others to be part of it. So if smaller firms don't have to go through the overhead burden and they can just participate and, and give their talents to the program, right? So that's a way we have been thinking about kind of scaling it. Um, we also, like two years ago, it was super successful. We, we were able to, to reach out to the four design schools in Louisiana and um, um, directly to their women in architecture, their, their AIAs and their NOMAs. And, um, and we had actually students be part of that. So I think of the day of service itself, right? So we have about 12 students coming from all the universities and be part of that day helping the community. So, and that was super gratifying for the kids and the students. So I, I think that that's where the idea of kind of bringing small firms and not necessarily have being you know a big event, it could be it could be kind of satellite that way. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jose. We're really appreciative of your time. Thank you, everyone, for reaching it out and watching online as well too. Thank you very much. Thank you.